Okay. Look, I just wanted to say how lucky we've been to actually have this show open and run. Uh, it's almost full course and have so many people attend um, at this time. That's an incredibly fortunate um, thing to do. Today I was going to um, run a tour through the exhibition. It was um, fully booked and because COVID has come to the ACT, um, I can't do that with um, that audience, but we've decided to record it as a substitute. Um, I'm standing in the middle room of the drill hall, this beautiful space for the show, and I'm standing in front of three rugs which depict King Amanullah. King Amanullah was the um, famous modernising um, king of Afghanistan who became king um, in 1919 and um, continued to rule Afghanistan until he was overthrown by a rebellion in 1929. He's famous for his attempts to modernise Afghanistan, particularly modernise Kabul, and a key component of that was to do with um, adopting Western dress and uh, women unveiling. Um, I've started here because this rug in the middle um, is the one rug in the show which predates the conflict of the last 40 years. Um, it's a rug where um, it's a mirror image of an original rug and um, if you look up here you will see the date 1347 in um, the Persian calendar. And 1347 is um, the year 1969 in our um, Gregorian calendar. So this is a rug which um, the predates the kind of current conflict which um, really starts in 1979, 1978. And um, so it's an important rug in a number of respects. It's, um, it's an example of how pictorial rugs, rugs which sometimes had portraits or had groups of people or were narrative in subject or might show landscapes, uh, flourished in the 1960s and 70s in a period in which Afghanistan was much more open to outsiders, including Westerners, than it had been before. And as part of that openness, there is a heightened market for pictorial rugs. So it's an example of pictorial rugs, which um, are what war rugs are as well, that this tradition predates the conflict. It's also a um, significant rug in the show because in many ways it is like a proto-war rug. King Amanullah um, attracted most fame in Afghanistan for initiating the Third Anglo-Afghan War, um, which was a war against the British and as a result of that war, um, waged in 1919, immediately after the end of the First World War, um, the British, which had controlled um, the foreign affairs of Afghanistan, relinquished that control, and um, as a result, Afghanistan gained its full independence. And so this rug shows um, King Amanullah in his military uniform with his medals. Um, one of the texts, which is above, um, is a text which says, Ghazi Amanullah Khan. And Ghazi um, is in origin an Arabic word, and it's a word um, which um, is often um, the meaning of which in English is given as, um, it, it's a term, a term of honor bestowed on um, a um, Islamic leader, a triumphant Islamic leader who defeats infidels. And so King Amanullah is here, um, Ghazi Amanullah Khan, for his um, success in the Third Anglo-Afghan War. 
um, that fits with this kind of idea that it's a sort of proto-war rug because it has this kind of um, military kind of title. And the fact that both down here in reverse, it has 1919 twice, both on the top and down the bottom, that, that is not only um, the year when he ascends the Afghan throne, but it's this crucial year when he fights this battle. So all of that fits with this being a rug which celebrates Amanullah's success in gaining Afghanistan independence through war. So all of that makes it a very relevant rug for the show. But the other reason why we included it in the show is that when Afghan weavers, whether they were, I guess, initially in Afghanistan and very soon thereafter as refugees in um, both Pakistan and Iran, began making war rugs, rugs which have got war imagery, one of the most common ways in which they created war rugs was to take pre-existing designs and then adapt them um, for the modern, for the contemporary conflict. And so one way of doing that was to take um, a rug like King Amanullah, and then if you move over to this rug here, you have the same figure, um, very much of King Amanullah. He's a bit simplified, in fact, um, Many things about this rug are simplified compared to the earlier one from 1969. But the crucial thing is that you have the figure of King Amanullah, um, renowned for this triumph against the British, but now you have this rug with an array of new imagery, um, a significant proportion of which is war imagery, which makes this very clearly a war rug and also shows one of the ways in which war rugs were um, created. Okay, so we'll now go into one of the other um, rooms in the show. Okay, so there are 49 rugs in the show. I can't talk about them all. Um, for that, you should read the catalogue or my book, Two Afternoons in the Carvel Stadium. You'll find out much more. Um, I'm focusing on this rug because it is of a type which um, became very popular and was produced in large numbers in the late 1980s, um, when the conflict had been going on for um, almost a decade, and around the time that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev announced that the Soviets uh, would be withdrawing, which he announced early in, in February 1988, and they left a year later in February 1989. And um, one of the key points of sale for war rugs was in Kabul, and um, there were lots of Soviet officials and officers in Kabul. And it was also a time where under President Naji Bulla, um, the ruler of Afghanistan then, um, Kabul had to a significant extent um, been reopened to Westerners. There were Western uh, journalists and diplomats and a range of Westerners who were in the city. And I guess the point I should make is that um, all Afghan rugs have been made over um, a long period, um, very much for Westerners. So something like 95% of production have been made um, for a kind of international market. And that is also true of war rugs. So as far as we um, can determine, the first war rugs are made by Afghan weavers as a form of self-expression. There are Afghan families who 
make rugs and they want to incorporate something of their experience and what is happening to their country through the imagery of the rug. So the rugs are initially a form of self-expression and there is an extraordinary diversity of designs. There's amazing creativity. Um, and within each design there are often wonderful variations, which is why in this show we often have groups of two or three because that gives um, the viewer the opportunity to, to see the variations um, within particular designs. But what gradually happens, of course, as with, I guess, any art form, is that the um, certain types of rug prove more popular and dealers order more of them. And this design is one of them. This is a quite common design um, which has, in its central field, has alternating ewers, um, so water containers, alternating with military hardware. So you have ewers, hardware, more ewers. And here, the text here is the Dari or Farsi text for the word tank. And this rug is particularly significant because um, an Indian journalist who wrote a feature about what Kabul was like and Afghanistan was like in 1989, immediately after the Soviets pull out, um, writes about war rugs. And there's a photo in his um, article in this Indian magazine where um, a dealer is holding a rug like this and the journalist um, reports that these rugs are known in Kabul, in the trade, as tankies because of this text. Um, so it's one of the types of rug which, we, um, which is exceptionally well documented through this article and the photograph. Um, one of the reasons I'm focusing on it here is also that if you think about war art in general, most war art is highly partisan. If you have a conflict, each side will produce its own war art which promotes its own cause. And one of the things which is really interesting about this style of rug and some related styles of rug which simply have um, big weaponry, the type of weaponry which was being used uh, by the Soviet forces in Afghanistan and by the Afghan government. These rugs were bought by both sides to the conflict. There's uh, good evidence of these rugs being bought both by Soviet officials and officers and by Westerners. And um, it seems to me that that happens because these rugs um, do not appear to be partisan. They seem to be about the fact of war, how war has come to the country, the kind of difference between these images of peace and war, but they are not partisan. And that fits with um, an array of these designs being bought by both sides to the conflict. All right, so having looked at... But that is also in a context where there are... Um, many rugs which are produced which are partisan. So particularly when you look at the production of rugs by refugees in um, both Pakistan and Iran, the refugee production, while it sometimes repeats um, rugs about the fact of war, which where the designs have originated in Afghanistan. Um, many of the designs which are produced, particularly in the late 1980s into the early 90s, are highly partisan. And this is an example of a rug with a very different type of origin. It's a rug, as you can see, of an Afghan woman um, wearing a veil, wearing a headscarf, Islamic green holding a baby, the kind of um, archetypal, perhaps even cliched, vulnerable citizen. And 
um, you know, she, with her hand, she is trying to ward off um, a bomb which has got the hammer and sickle on it. So um, a, a bomb from the uh, Soviet Union. And then here we have um, a mosque which is in flames. This is an example of a type of, of a rug which almost certainly was based on a political poster. And there are many instances where, as far as we know, the posters do not survive. The posters turn out to be ephemeral. They get pasted up on, wall, on walls. No one values them. Um, they don't appear to be in any public collections. But the rugs which are based on the poster uh, survive. So this is you know, a very clear anti-Soviet image. Um, it's an exceptional rug because um, in basing it on the poster, the weavers have done nothing to um, make the design conform to standard modes of Afghan rug production. So normally Afghan rugs have elaborate borders. This rug is, um, seems to be a direct reproduction of the poster. It's clearly partisan, anti-Soviet, and um, there is nothing where um, the poster has been adapted into the conventions of Afghan rug making. All right, so now we'll go is, um, touring back through, um, through the show, and I'll just um, build on the kind of points I've been making. So, I mean, the, the, the exhibition um, you know, in, in includes um, you know, rugs of, 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 of great proportions which kind of command the space um, and um, built on, you know, because Nigel Lendon's collection is um, central to the show, um, he's had a particular interest in rugs which incorporate maps. And, you know, if you come over here, um, there is again huge variety um, between them. This um, is a rug which is dated. It's um, dated um, 1991. It was probably based on a school atlas, um, the kind of maps which you find there. It is of a map of Europe. It then has the various flags underneath. And um, it's a war rug because of the incorporation of all the war imagery in the border. And um, I guess it's a mark of the diversity of these rugs. The difference between this rug, where you have the Soviet Union over there in the far right, and, um, you know, it's a very kind of literal, um, easily read map of Europe. Whereas if you move over to this rug, um, you know, which in part has um, similarities in terms of the militaria um, being in the border and the way in which the, this equipment has been rendered. But here in this map of the world, you get this, I guess from our point of view, this just wonderfully um, abstracted um, map of the world. So the, both the similarities and the contrast um, between these two maps, I guess, goes to the heart of the show. Um, if we come over here, and I, I, in this talk I, I'm kind of focusing a bit on the rugs which are more overtly political because they're of particular interest to me, um, one of the forms of rug which became, which had the biggest production in the late 1980s were, the, were small maps which were um, typically made in the many refugee camps in northwestern Pakistan. 
this is at a time when there were about six million Afghan refugees. They were the biggest group of refugees in the world. Um, Afghans um, prior to the current kind of upsurge of conflict was still the second largest group of refugees, registered refugees in the world and um, clearly um, that shocking number is, um, is growing at the moment and will continue to grow. So there was a very large refugee population. They were um, confined to these camps in Pakistan at a time when the rest of the world didn't want to take Afghan refugees. Iran and Pakistan took the overwhelming bulk. And there is a form of production where they make what have become known as Kalashnikov maps, where the Kalashnikov, as you can see here and here, is the dominant motif. And um, one of the things which is interesting about that is that um, the Kalashnikov was, of course, a, um, a weapon which was used by both sides. The Kalashnikov had been um, invented by Mr. Kalashnikov in the 1940s. It was used by the Soviet forces. It was used by client states of the Soviet Union. It was used by both the Soviet forces in Afghanistan and those of the Soviet-supported Afghan government of Naji Buller. So the weapon is one which is used by both sides and is actually one which is reified by both sides. But it is ultimately somehow claimed um, most pers uh, persuasively, I guess, um, by the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen, for them, it is their prime weapon in large part. They're using Kalashnikovs, which are actually um, bought for them by the Soviet Union, but by the United States and by the, um, the Saudi Arabian government. Um, there's kind of knockoff production in China. Um, but the Kalashnikov, even though used by both sides, becomes kind of like the ultimate symbol of the Mujahideen, as it does for um, many rebel and also terrorist groups. And therefore, it is on these maps as a symbol of the Mujahideen. Um, these are um, implicitly, they're, they're pro-Mujahideen rugs. They're, they are um, partisan. Um, these rugs um, were produced, as I said, in huge numbers. They become more interesting because of their, if and when they have texts. Often the text will say Kalashnikov, which you can see here, um, sometimes in scrambled form, and quite a number of these rugs are dated. And um, texts are really important on these rugs to give them a kind of, to, they help us um, approach them with greater specificity and be able to place them in time and space. So this rug, because of the text, is more specific and more interesting than many of them. But this one is even more interesting again. This um, rug is exceptional for the extent of uh, the text, both in Dari, Farsi, and in English, um, and also its imagery. It's exceptional for having the image of the International Red Cross, which was active in um, the conflict from its very beginning, had its headquarters in Peshawar. And if you look at the text here, you can see that here you have the name Jacques de Mau, and then International Committee of the Red Cross, and then various sort of a P.O. box number, an address in University Town Peshawar, a telex number. Um, Jacques de Mau in the late 1980s was a Red Cross official in Peshawar. This is the mirror text. This text must have been based on his business card. And it's, we don't know why. Jacques de Mau is now head of the International Red Cross um, in the occupied territories in Palestine. 
Um, I have written to him, tried to write to him, ask him whether he commissioned a rug like this, whether this is a, a replica of it, whether he knows anything about the origins of the rug. But the rug is exceptional um, because of its sort of relation to a specific official, but up here there are also details of the particular camp where it, is made, it was made and possibly also the carpet maker. So dealing with rugs where it is often, as I just said, very difficult to locate them precisely in terms of who made them, where they were made, when they were made, um, in this exhibition and in the accompanying catalogue, we've tried to focus on rugs. In part, we've focused on rugs which have texts because the texts help us locate the rugs. And this rug, which has got both unusual imagery and exceptional text, is a prime example of that. I'll give one final um, talk about three other rugs, um, which in the drill hall sh showing, and we're really hopeful this exhibition will travel to other venues, but at the drill hall, these rugs here are the first you see as you come into the show. And um, they show a kind of progression. So this, so it's, this rug, this runner, is again based on a political poster. There was a political poster which um, had Naji Buller, who the Soviets had installed as um, the ruler of Afghanistan in 1986. And there was a poster produced by the interim government of the Mujahideen in Peshawar in the late 80s. And it showed, as the rug does, Naji Buller here with the hammer and sickle, um, like a tattoo or birthmark on his forehead. And then he is being depicted as a Soviet puppet. So there is both a stylized hammer and sickle and there is also um, a hand which is actually meant to be <coughs> the paw of the Russian bear holding Naji Bulla. So he's depicted as a Soviet puppet. He is, the hand is coming down from the Soviet Union, characteristically in red. He is depicted against the map of Afghanistan um, in Islamic green, and he's under attack by Mujahideen. So this is a poster um, the poster gets transformed into a rug. It's one of the instances where there is actually documentation that a particular um, significant dealer who'd been a very important dealer in Herat and Kabul, who then flees to Pakistan and has a store in Islamabad and a kind of branch store in Peshawar. This dealer, Sufi Abdul Wahid, he sees the poster and he thinks it will make a great rug design. It fits his pro-Mujahideen politics, and he gets rugs made. And the first versions of these rugs, um, some of them still have the original text from the poster saying, published by the interim Mujahideen government. And one of the rugs has commissioned by Sufi Abdul Wahid. So this is an example of um, how dealers can shape production. They can shape production because they order more of particular types of rug, while other rugs, which may to us now seem at least as interesting, um, are not the subject of the same orders and therefore their production stops. Um, and dealers can also influence production by actually commissioning weavers to begin production, which is what happened with these now Jibullah rugs. The first of these Najibullah rugs are rugs which um, are shown in borders, but unlike the, the rug I talked about before with the woman with her hand warding, warding off the bomb. But very quickly, one of the great innovations of the weavers who make these rugs in Pakistan, the refugees who make them, is that they come up 
with this bullet border where you get groups of three alternating bullets in different colours facing different directions. And it's one of the, we don't know the name, as often is the case, we don't know the name of the uh, weaver who had this idea that rather than a traditional border, there should be this kind of distinctive military border. But having conceived it, um, it becomes a border which is used on many other types of rugs. So. Um, if we move from here, the Naji Buller rug, to this rug in the centre, this rug, um, as you'll see, has many things in common with the previous one. You get the map of Afghanistan, you get the bullet border, you get a Soviet hand, you get the hammer and sickle, you get lots of um, military. What is, um, in terms of our exhibition, I guess, exceptional about this rug, apart from the fact that the imagery is so um, striking. Here you can see another hammer and sickle and what is happening here is meant to be the uh, hammer and sickle being incinerated and this is against a text where the text says jihad. So a crucial word, a crucial text to have a rug on a rug like this. This is of um, I think the only time where in looking at the production of these rugs um, I've been able to discover the poster and actually locate the poster which forms the source of the rug. So um, anyway, the poster is reproduced in the catalogue. The poster, um, there was an American who was a, a student of the University of Chicago um, he was in Peshawar in the early 90s and he collected um, political posters produced by the Mujahideen and then he later gave that collection to the University of Chicago's Middle Eastern Library which in wonderful fashion has digitalised all those posters and also translated the texts on them. And so if you look at the catalogue, and we may be able to splice this into this video, you'll see the relationship between the source, the poster, which has the hand coming down but actually has the fingers being incinerated as well as the hammer and sickle, and in the text of Jihad has that letter there very much more clearly as a pistol fitting the term Jihad. But this rug, um, so dramatic in nature is possibly the only example where we can actually see how weavers translate um, a different form of artistic production, um, the poster, into a rug. And then finally, the final rug I'll talk about today, um, another runner, um, so framing the jihad rug. Um, this rug is one of a relatively small group of designs where we can see that post 9-11, post the um, Americans staging their Operation Enduring Freedom, um, ousting uh, the Taliban, where weavers um, respond to that. Of course, there are many 9-11 rugs which are in the show, but in terms of um, events within Afghanistan. Here you can see that following the Naji Bulla and the Jihad rugs, um, you have the military, you have the Soviet Union, uh, which would now be the Stan countries in red, you have the map of Afghanistan in white, um, you have Iran, you have uh, Pakistan, you have the same kind of structure with the bullet border, but here you have this extraordinary image in the centre where you have the hat of Uncle Sam and a Kalashnikov um, coming out of it. And um, Uncle Sam hats, not surprisingly, do feature in quite a bit of imagery to do with the war, particularly imagery produced by the communist government, which was anti-American. They have Uncle Sam hats as kind of being a source, and Uncle Sam hats sort of fund the Mujahideen. Um, Uncle Sam, of course, as I've said before, talking about the Kalashnikov maps, um, bought many of the Kalashnikovs for the Mujahideen, um, creating the arms 
um, pipeline which supported the, the fighting in the 1980s. Um, we, it isn't quite clear why in the early 2000s um, an Afghan weaver should develop this image of the Kalashnikov coming out of the Uncle Sam hat. But what is striking is that in earlier iterations of this rug, rather than having all this sort of military here, there are mujahideen who are, um, have their weapons sort of poised, at, um, aimed at the um, Uncle Sam hat and Kalashnikov. And um, if one thinks maybe of those fighters not being actually Mujahideen but possibly Taliban, then that relationship with them against the Uncle Sam hat makes much more sense. Anyway, this is, um, yeah, so here at this point in the exhibition you can see um, extraordinary um, rich innovation over time in war rugs, which has been characteristic of their development. Thank you.